Hi guys, and a special hello to any of you who happen to be new to my channel. My name is Jennifer. I live in New York where I work in publishing and write book reviews and I've been ill for most of December. So I'm just so happy that I'm at the point where I can film this video about my favorite books of 2018. I read something like 140 to 150 books this year and there happened to be 10 on this list. These aren't the best books I read in 2018. That would be a somewhat different list in a different order but these are the ones that have latched onto my heart. So number 10 is After You'd Gone by Maggie O'Farrell, her debut. She's since written six other novels and a memoir, and this is the first book I read this year. It follows a woman named Alice who falls into a coma after stepping into traffic, and you know she's in love with someone, but you're not sure why this man won't come to her in her moment of need. In some ways, I'm surprised this made my list because O'Farrell's writing, at least in her first few books, is a little wordy for my taste. And there's a subplot with Alice's parents that's extremely predictable. But this novel emotionally walloped me. The main relationship made me understand on an almost chemical level how vulnerable we make ourselves in love. So that when I finished this, I was like, I don't wanna to talk to anyone. I don't wanna to listen to any music. I'm having a moment. Number nine is another debut and one most of you will be familiar with, the memoir educated by Tara Westover. Yes, my hand is also on the crank of this particular hype machine. Westover grew up in rural Idaho in a family of extremes. Her father, was deeply paranoid about government involvement in his life, which meant he avoided things like birth certificates, hospitals, schools. So Tara and her siblings, even more so than average children, grew up with an isolated worldview controlled by their parents. And this is her account of how going to college and eventually getting a PhD from Cambridge contextualized her family and changed that worldview. I didn't think this book would be for me. I'm not particularly interested in cults or cult mentalities, but it's written with this layered nostalgia and, and such clear-eyed sadness and love for the conflicting truths of each of her family members. I personally wish that she'd included more specifics about her time at Cambridge, but still, of all the books on this list, this is the one I'd feel most comfortable recommending to the most people. Number eight is When I Hit You by Mina Kandasami, her second novel. I'm a fan of the book that won the Women's Prize this year, but this is still my personal winner. It's told from the perspective of a young Indian woman married to a professor who becomes abusive. And the arc of the book, which you learn at the beginning, records the escalation of his abuse and her ultimate escape from this marriage. It's a surprisingly delicate act of storytelling. The narrator is witty and observant. And because this narrator is a writer, as she experiences each moment, she's already considering how she's going to record it later. And the novel becomes a commentary on how people who've been treated like they're worth nothing reclaim their sense of power and worth in their own eyes. All of the natural adjectives used to describe a book like this, you know, powerful, important, unflinching, are often used because of a book's subject matter and not necessarily its quality, but this earns those adjectives on both accounts. Color me shocked that number seven ended up on here. It's David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. I don't think I'll ever love Dickens' style overall, but I do love this book. And it was Dickens' own favorite of all of his novels, likely because of its autobiographical nature. It's a meticulous first-person account of the early life of David Copperfield from his infancy up to about his mid-twenties. And as you'd expect, the majority of the narrative is dedicated to fleshing out the various personalities surrounding him. My favorite character is his elderly aunt, Betsy Trotwood. She's so great, you guys. One of my favorite details about her is that she's on a crusade to keep donkeys out of her yard, which I took as a veiled Don Quixote reference, mostly because I think everything should be a veiled Don Quixote reference. I will say the older women come off much better than the younger in here in terms of seeming like humans. Uh, you know, Dickens plays with caricatures in general for, for all genders of characters, but I am still glad I didn't read this in the first flower of my feminism, but it's really, 
the tenor of this novel that got to me. It's, it's full of warmth and longing and David is a wonderful character. I read about 65% of this and the rest I listened to on audiobook, the version narrated by Richard Armitage. Can't recommend that rude enough and not just for the yum factor. He really conveys the spirit of the novel. Although I can't in good faith recommend listening to the entire audiobook because being low-key turned on for 36 hours is medically unsafe. Number six is The Golden Fool by Robin Hobb. This is the second book in the third trilogy in an overarching epic fantasy series called The Realm of the Elderlings. And if you're confused by that description, I'll leave a link to a no spoilers video that I made on the first three trilogies in this overarching series. This is my favorite of the 11 books I've read by her. It follows the characters from the first trilogy and they live in a typical medieval European fantasy world and they get involved with magic systems and political clashes, but that doesn't do justice to what Hobb achieves, especially through her characters um, who are great in that first trilogy, but become so much more in here. There are scenes in this book that are gutting and the two main protagonists, Fitz and the Fool, have a relationship that's unique and goes beyond any lazily constructed boundaries of friendship or love. The Tawny Man books in general are particularly insightful about how people's perspectives change as they age and how first person narration is both a gift and a hindrance to readers. Number five is Signs for Lost Children by Sarah Moss, her fourth novel. I've read all seven of her books now and think this is her best. It's such a rich reading experience. Technically it's the sequel to a book called Bodies of Light, which I also recommend, but you can read them as standalones. And this one follows a young Victorian couple who experience a period of prolonged separation very early in their marriage. The woman, Allie, stays in Britain and is one of the country's first female doctors. She works in an asylum in Cornwall. And her husband, Tom, is an engineer who travels to perform temporary work in Japan. The chapters alternate perspectives in this measured, meditative way, and the dual narratives examine the stories that individuals and entire cultures tell to frame life, to try to contain it and how some people choose instead to begin their own stories. There's so many subtle touches in here, like how Tom finds himself immersed in a culture that's preoccupied with dignity, while the women Allie works with are stripped of theirs. The craft involved is, is ridiculous. So if you're the type of reader who enjoys picking out and piecing together intricate details, you'll appreciate this one. Getting up there now, number four is Regarding the Pain of Others by Susan Sontag. More than any other writer this year, she's affected my day-to-day -day life by making me question my assumptions and altering how I consider certain topics. This was her last published book before she died, and it's an interrogation of truisms surrounding images of suffering. Sontag especially focuses on war photography with some commentary on paintings, on news programs as well, and I found myself being gently nudged out of certain mental grooves I hadn't known I'd formed. What's our true reaction to images of suffering? Is it pity? What are the implications of pity? Is it shock, shame, voyeurism, compassion, and what, if anything, is gained from these feelings? Why do we automatically assume that we learn something from these images, as though having felt something is the same as having learned something? This is the type of book where throwaway lines and phrases in the middle of sentences would make me pause and reread and rethink. If the camera angle looks slightly different, it's because my phone just fell on top of me. Anyway, number three is another debut novel, this time a 2018 release, Fire Sermon by Jamie Quattro. I feel about this how I felt about The Lesser Bohemians by Emer McBride last year, in that I see where it warps in some places, but I don't really care because what it does well, I love so much. It's about a woman named Maggie who marries at 21, quickly has two kids, and who sees all the ways her husband is lovely, truly lovely. But then she begins an affair, first of words, with a poet who shares her religious sensibilities. And the novel goes on to explore the slippery nature of eroticism and how you can build a good life with somebody without sharing mental or spiritual sympathy with them. The novel's filled with fluid, sharp-eyed prose that has this underlying hunger 
to it and Quattro quietly builds tension and scenes of ordinary life. I'm so looking forward to following her work in the coming years. That's it for fiction because number two is another memoir, The Cost of Living, a Working Autobiography by Deborah Levy, author of many works across genres. I read her most recent novel, Hot Milk, and liked it a lot, but this is something else. It's a spare book about the period after her marriage ended when she moved to a dumpy apartment and began reshaping her life, but that doesn't give an accurate feel of it because like with Moss's book, this is for readers who enjoy tracing all the glittering threads scattered throughout. Levy is brilliant in such a humble way and she recounts these vivid snippets of life, riding to work on her new bicycle, cooking with a friend, listening to her cuckoo clock. Through it all, she's grappling with the idea of major and minor characters and how difficult it is for a middle-aged woman to be perceived as a major character, especially if she can't be defined by categories like wife, lover, daughter, homemaker. I love sprawling narratives, but there's something about a book where every syllable feels intentional so that the whole is this perfect cut glass creation. Side note, I originally picked this up for an interview. Didn't get that job, but I mean, not a bad deal to have it lead to a new favorite. So my top pick for 2018 in a turn of events I would never have anticipated before this year is a biography. Prairie Fire is the American Dreams of Laura Ingalls Wilder by Caroline Fraser, winner of this year's Pulitzer Prize for a biography. And it's a surprise success story. Neither its agent nor its editor really expected the attention it's gotten. You know you love a book when you don't even know where to begin. I just want to share all the things about this. Maybe I should make a separate video. I don't know. Let me know if any of you would be interested in that. This is a biography in three parts of the author of The Little House Books, which revolutionized children's publishing in the US and helped form the country's foundational image of Western pioneering in the mid-19th century. The first part details Laura Ingalls Wilder's early life, what actually happened, not necessarily what she wrote. The second describes the middle years of her adulthood, which I knew very little about. And the final part follows her from the age of 57, when she first sat down to write a memoir of her childhood as she saw that way of life disappearing. Wilder has become a more controversial figure over time, especially with her portrayal of Native Americans, but Fraser approaches everything constructively. She's not interested in condemning or apologizing for Wilder, she's contextualizing her. And it was a joy to have these books that meant so much to me growing up placed in their historical framework to understand the larger political, cultural, and environmental forces that resulted in the series' memorable episodes. And in the end, the overarching paradox of the Little House books is that in their mission to lionize Wilder's parents, especially Charles Ingalls, her father, they presented the family story as one of rugged, enviable individualism, hard work leading to a fulfilling life, when in reality, the Ingalls story was proof that isolated settlers were almost doomed to fail in the early American system. Backbreaking work and fierce independence so often were not enough even to stay alive, let alone to live. So this is a lucid portrait of a remarkable woman and the country that shaped her and how she in turn idealized that country in a way that stuck and that largely wasn't false. But she didn't tell the whole story and Fraser thoroughly, gracefully fills in so much more. Thank you for watching, you guys. Please let me know your thoughts below, especially if you're interested in any of these books. You know how that fills my heart. And I'll see you in 2019 for more bookish discussions.